So today's topic is component object models, otherwise known as binary components or uh, component objects or lots of different names. And this is really the cutting edge, maybe the wave of the future of software technology. So there's a lot of um, hype involved in this area right now, a lot of competition, a lot of you know competing technologies and views thinking their way is the best. You know, a lot of people are trying interesting things, some of which are failing, some of which are succeeding. Um, on the other hand, there are a couple of core ideas behind this, which I think are very good and are very powerful, and in one form or another eventually su will succeed. So most of this lecture is not going to be Java-specific technology. It's going to talk about things at a fairly high Java language independent area, which is very much the, uh, the flavor and theme of component object models or binary components. Um, so with that inspiring introduction, let's, uh, let's go on. What are these binary components? Up to now, we've talked about things. Uh, we've talked about components when referring to GUI widgets. Okay, And binary components are something like the GUI objects in that they're things that you can embed in your program and use and give you useful functionality, but um, they are, it's kind of an extension, a, a great extension of that. Um, it's also an extension of the notion of classes, okay? It's very much, you know, you can think of components, binary components, as classes and object-oriented programming on steroids. It's just that idea, but then more so. Um, the goal is to really push some of our ideas behind object-oriented programming, in particular reusable code, encapsulation, and abstraction to the next level. Okay? We have a lot of the stuff in Java with our class libraries and classes that you can use and build. Um, components, the component idea is to take that to the next level by abstracting it along, among, along a number of new directions. For example, to use a class in Java or any language, traditionally you need to have it written in the same language, compile it together. You know, it has to be available at compile time. So you compile all these things together in one program and you use them. You, uh, take, you can take classes and extend them to add additional functionality. So that means the classes can be pretty basic functionality, the library classes that you get. Um, so some of the notions that uh, components try and abstract against is language independence. It would be nice to be able to use a class that wasn't necessarily written in the language that your application was written in. Okay, Maybe you want the functionality of the class to be written in some language that optimizes for efficiency, but you want to use it in, um, in some program that's optimized for programmer niceness because all the really, you know, all the really hard stuff is in, done in this class and all you're doing is kind of organizing how it's supposed to be put together. Um, Another thing is, I can call it location independence. We're trying to accomplish here. Independence. Um, right now, when our classes are basically running in the same process as our application, any utility classes, we'd like to be able to make things work so that the class could be running in a different process, or maybe even on a different machine, um, a, you know, on a, on a different machine on our company intranet or on the internet. So we would like to be able to make method calls or talk to classes that are halfway around the world and have it work pretty much the same way. Um, we want to further... Um, further extend encapsulation so we only uh, expose behavior through abstract interfaces.
And as you can see, in order clearly to make this and this work, you really have to go do a good job on this because, you know, if, if you don't know where the thing is and what language it's written in, you really have to do a good job in your abstract specification. Um, finally, we need to really work on uh, these things tend to stress configurability. Um, this is mainly driven by the fact that if something's written in a different language and maybe resides not on your machine, it's very hard to inherit from that. So in order to, to get the functionality, generality that you often get by taking uh, a class in, say, the Java class library and then inheriting from it to, to uh, specify its functionality for your application, okay, you have to push that back in that the, the builders of the components have to kind of anticipate a wide range of different uses and applications and add a whole mess of configurable parameters that let you set things up um, to, kind of, to kind of customize this component for the way your application wants to use it. Okay, so, so the basic idea is classes, but abstracted so that uh, you can pass things around instead of as source files as binary files that uh, can be used by different languages and can reside in different locations and whatever. And let's see, there are three, I would say, three players in this game right now and a pile of technologies. Um, there's Microsoft's set of technologies which go by the name of Olay, Com, DCOM, ActiveX. These are really the same underlying thing, but targeted towards slightly different applications. There's the Java versions of these, which are yikes, Java Beans, um, RMI, Remote Method Invocation, and uh, EJB, which we won't talk about uh, too much. And then finally, there's a bunch of technology put out by OMG. It's a standards body. I think it's called the Object Management Group, or does anybody know what OMG stands for? No, I guess not. Anyway, they put out this thing called CORBA, um, which is the um, common object uh, what resource broker architecture, and they have a protocol. Okay, so kind of these are kind of protocols, and you know there's a lot of uh, acronyms here, but these are kind of the three implementations of this technology I could think of. There's yes. Who's the intended beneficiary of the what I could drive in this? Well, it, uh, it depends. Um, this technology, when you think about how it's used, implemented, or, or the pieces you get, pretty much splits right away into two kind of user communities, each, and these, some of these things are tailored to each user community. Um, so I'll call the two applications scripting, scripted components, or scriptable, Let's call them scriptable components. And distributed objects. OK. And the difference between those really depends on whether you're, you're pushing the configurability and language independence um, and the ability to, to easily script functionality, or whether you're pushing the location independence and really the high-level interface description. These tend to be used by application programmers to glue together pieces to make applications. Uh, these tend to support uh, very sophisticated enterprise applications. These are being driven 
uh, to first extent probably by the people pushing the technology um, and by to a second extent certainly the people in um, uh, enterprise software groups who have you know these all these machines all over the world with all this data that they somehow want to get to work together and this is driven by uh, well, the fact that it's very powerful from the, from the software developer's point of view and might be the future of application design. So let's talk about scriptable, scriptable components first. Uh, this was, I'm not sure it was started by uh, Microsoft, but certainly they have pushed it for a while with their Olay and ActiveX technologies. And the uh, Java equivalent is Java Beans. And the idea is, going back to what I said, wouldn't it be nice if, Lots of functionality, you know, instead of you as a programmer having to sit down and design all your functionality over again from scratch every time you wanted to do an application or see if there were libraries in the particular language that you were using to help you, say you had a bunch of components that capsul encapsulated high-level functionality pieces that you wanted to use. Um, for example, for... You know, a lot of these revolve around building GUI applications. And some of the things that would, might be nice to have are, say, a chart component. Say you would, you know, want to embed in your application the ability to, to graph data in various chart forms, okay, and just display the data that you have. Now, you could go through and spend, you know, week after week writing a charting package, you know, that displays in your, you know, your particular program. But, you know, that's kind of a reinventing the wheel. Charting packages are not new technology, and they're out there certainly in standalone programs. There's lots of things that would do charts or spreadsheets. There's lots of standalone spreadsheet activity. Wouldn't it be nice if you, know, you wanted to build an application that was not just a spreadsheet program but wanted to embed spreadsheet functionality? You know, Maybe one of your tabs in your tab display pulled up a spreadsheet to display your data. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a thing, a component, that encapsulated chart display or spreadsheet functionality that you could just include and it would be there. You know, the power of those of you who fooled around with the table widget, the table widget here gives you the power of doing that. So the question is, how would you use this thing? And the idea of these things is they are scriptable at very high levels, you know, to, to use a chart a Excel spreadsheet, even from you know computer controls, is much easier than writing them. So the power that you need to kind of control one of these things is very simple compared to the power computational power you need to write one. Another nice component for a different sort of applications might be speech synthesizer. Very, very complicated to write a speech synthesizer. But once you have one, the behavior is very easy. You send it a text string, and it either speaks uh, the, the thing out of the speaker or gives you a waveform back, which is the, uh, the audio. So very simple behavior, uh, but very complex implementation. So if somebody else did the implementation, gave you this black box that you could incorporate, and then you could just say, you know, translate this or uh, play this, you know, speak this, this, this sentence, and it would just happen for you. Uh, now, the mechanics of how you, what one of these objects look like um, depends, uh, you know, in detail, depends on how, which one of these technologies you use. In Java, it basically looks like a jar file or just a class file um, that you pull in. And, um, but they are, the thing about these things is they have to be configurable since they're going to be used in a variety of programs and you might want to use them slightly differently. They have lots of properties um, at, that correspond roughly to instance variables that let you configure what type of chart you want, for example, or you know, what language you want the synthesizer to work in, or whether it's supposed to be high-pitched voice or low-pitched voice. Lots of configuration parameters because they're meant to be reused in a variety of contexts as is. Um, and a cool thing about this component technology is that the, all these parameters and all these objects are self-describing, okay? This technology makes heavy use of the notion of introspection. So you use the, the equivalent of the class class in Java or interface descriptions up here to be able to tell, given an object that you know nothing about, the program can 
uh, you, you can write a program that will look at the object and tell you what properties it has, it necessarily, not necessarily the semantics, but what the get and set methods are, what the types of those properties are. And once you know the types of a property, you know how to edit it, right? So if you have a property that's a string, you know how to tell, give the user the, the ability to uh, specify that property because you can pop up a little string, in, a text input box, um, have them type in the string they want to configure, um, grab that string, use it to set the property, and you can write a program to do this without any knowledge of what that property is really doing. All you know is that you have getter and setter methods on a string property. Similarly, if it's a color property, you can pop up a color editor, um, and, uh, and so on. So very powerful. So the kind of ultimate version of this uh, currently is when you have components um, written in, say, um, com and o ActiveX, that you use Visual Basic to script together, okay? And this means that you can assemble your GUIs, you can basically do your entire GUI programming and maybe your entire application programming from a drag and drop visual editor. You just drag buttons on, you, gra you drag components on, on a, um, a layout editor. And since the layout editor can ask one of these components, you know, what are, your set, what are your set methods? What are your get methods? What are your properties? What events do you handle? All this. It can pull up this and give you um, a graphical environment to just set these things. And, uh, and so in a very short time of playing with one of these graphical editors, you uh, can do you know, something that would take you probably days of, uh, of programming. And uh, it's probably much more compelling to see it. Right, and... P slash Java slash JDK. Oh. 1.3 slash bin colon path. All right. Uh, CD. Now, this is a demo I found on the Sun site, and the book talks about this a little. Um, this is actually just a shadow of what you could do with you know, a commercial product and, uh, vi you know, a real visual basic component editor and drag and drop layout thing. But it nonetheless gives you an idea of what we're trying to do here. So this is our um, uh, template for the application that we're trying to, uh, to design. And here is a palette of components that the thing knows about. Um, all it knows is that it has these components. It doesn't know any of the details of these components. It just gets these components in the form of jar files. You notice it came up with a thing that said uh, analyze jar files when it started up. And uh, that means it's looking through all of these. It's figuring out what methods um, through introspection, what properties they have, what methods they have, what events they handle. So here's one called juggler, which I can just pick up. And it took me a while to figure out the buttons, but uh -oh, maybe I didn't figure out the buttons, or maybe we crashed. Are we crashed? Oh, heavens. No, this is a really strange user interface, and it takes... You think? I don't think so. No, that this. Oh, that's the current selected component. But uh, let's try one of these. No, there's my juggler. I don't know why things were so weird, but there's my juggler component. So as soon as I drag and drop it, it starts going. And let's drag a blue button. 
just see if. Okay. That's all it does. Okay. <laughs> but this isn't what's cool about it. Okay. So let's drag another button. Okay. Now I think I've got the hang of it. And let's move this puppy up here. All right. So now I've got, you know, with doing very little work, I've got three things on my GUI, which is pretty cool. But now let's see. I want to do something with this button. Uh, certainly I don't like the idea that it's just press. So let's change its number to its label to stop. And I don't like its color so much, so we'll change it to pink. Um, and now I want it to do something. So let's see. Let's edit its events and say when I click it, that's the action event and the action performed routine. And look at this. It gives me this magic little pointer. And I say, OK, I want to hook it up to this thing. So I click, and now it gives me the list of methods that don't take any arguments that it found on this thing. So I could destroy it, but just let's make it stop juggling. So it does some thinking, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now, ooh. <laughs> All right, so now let's do it again. Let's change our foreground, because this button we can't see. Let's make this puppy white. And uh, so press. Press is not very informative. So let's go to start. And we're done with that. And let's do at, hook up an event to this one. Action performed. Hook it up to here again. And we'll have it start juggling. And it has to do some work. Now start. Stop. Start. <laughs> Stop. All right, one more. Here's a, this one's kind of cool. It's a little molecular display uh, component. Um, it has a number of different molecules you can display. This one is uh, what? Uh, I forget. It will probably tell me. Ah, uh, yes, here we go. Uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that, but it's by far the most interesting one. Eh, that one's pretty interesting, too. Uh, but let's go back to this one. All right. All right, so and let's do one more thing. Let's get another, another button. And we won't fool around with this label, but again, we'll edit its events. That's action event, uh, mouse spaz. And we'll go here. And this one has a completely different set of, of things we can do. But rotate Y sounds like a fun one. Can you send arguments into that? Um, I think that's, it's harder to do automatically. You would have to pop up a dialog box to bind what arguments you were sending in. But it's pretty cool. Now, well, let's try doing, let's get a little risky here and take, oh, I don't have a lot of mouse space here, action performed, and let's bind it to this guy to the start juggling. Now, I rotate that once and start juggling. <laughs> rotate that guy once, start juggling. So if you think about how long it would take you to program up that application, or take me to program up that application, you know, um, molecular molecular drawing is not is not tri is not incredibly complicated, but very tedious. You know, notice the nice shadowing and shading and 3D stuff here. That's a bit, bit of a pain to do well, um, and you know, just the the general both building these things and then putting them together. Now, I believe, I'm not going to try this, I can uh, um, actually dump this whole application out in some format and uh, then just run it as an application. So this is what the idea of these things are for scriptical components. Did if you, you the source code? Hmm? Um, no, it does. It would also produce the source code um, as well. Um, 
So this is what you can do with these scriptable, scriptable components. Um, commercial systems are orders of magnitude better than this uh, because you know they're they're real and robust and handle have many more components and wizards and the ability to make new components. Um, but they would let you plug, pu build applications uh, plugging con connecting these things together just really easily. My office mate is uh, is great at this back at my day job, and uh, he pulled together a, uh, a you know a, a Visual Basic GUI app that did kind of some task he had to do in like an hour that used you know fairly a fair number of components, and uh, you know to do that by hand would have been a, a lot a lot of work. So this technology really has the promise of letting the programmer really think about the high-level organization of your program and glue together these pre predefined components. Or if you like doing the low-level programming, you can go into the component manufacturer business and make the world's best, you know, speed synthesis component or the world's best juggler component or, you know, the world's best chart component or spreadsheet component. And then you can go and sell these or give them away and people can embed them in their apps and the whole world is a better and happier place. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is just very powerful stuff and it's a little scary to traditional programmers that, you know, oh no, I get, don't get to write everything all myself, but after a while, you know, you get over it. Um, <laughs> Well, right. The language independence, of course, you don't see so much in the Java independence because the uh, the classes are written in Java and then the um, they're scripted together in Java. But because, of course, you know, Java is the best uh, language for writing, implementing components, and it's the best scripting language, and it slices and dices and does everything. But if you're working in some other technologies, often say an ActiveX component would be written in C or C++. And then you would script it in Visual Basic, or you know you could use the same ideas to build complex components written in C, script them from Perl or from Tickle, or any number of scripting languages that lets you organize a GUI and connect things up without worrying about you know low-level storage management and data layout and all that sort of thing. So uh, so that's that's where the language independence comes in. You you're right. You don't see it so much in Java because Java is kind of a complete world. But once you get outside, uh, you do see it. And you know, using the, it's easy enough to take Java things and wrap them in, put language bindings for another language in them. Actually, that's a little harder. But you can also take a C program, wrap it in a Java wrapper, and use that inside Java. So. Um, one of the list of things is a sorter bean that you can pick over there. Is that like a bean within a bean type? Uh, sorter bean. To be honest, I have no idea what this does. Seems like a different class than everything else. Algorithm bubble sort. Oh, well, I've seen that one before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. It probably doesn't. It's probably non display. Yeah, it could be. I have no idea. Let's see. Buying properties. There's a, a demo app. It just sorts itself, and you can watch it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there it goes. Yay! It's starting. I guess we just need to. Let me it's Wow, well, that's going to take a million years. <laughs> all right, well, that'll give you something to watch instead of me. Um, all right, the last thing I want to talk about is a somewhat different targeting of the same idea, which is these encapsulated binary objects that you can use in various ways. And um, focus more on the language independence or location independence. I know, it's great. Uh, <laughs> um, up to now, we've been pretty much having our objects and our little app that calls the objects um, enclosed in one process, one program that's all nicely linked and compiled together. So this guy can do a can know about this class, can do a new to get an instance of this class. It can then call a method on this class 
and use basically a normal procedure call mechanism and all that. So say we want to do uh, all the things we do with our normal classes, but we wanted to do it on an object class that's hosted over here on a different machine connected by networks. So how can we possibly make this technology work and essentially keep this application looking pretty much the same? So this is you know, the beginnings of what, what this whole distributed objects deal is about. So to do this, we have to think about, all right, what, we need, what do we need to do this? Um, we need to be able to construct a new instance of an object. We need to um, be able to have a reference to an object. We need to know the interface of the object so we know what methods can call. OK, so now we've managed to get something. We know what methods we call. We need a way to pass our arguments. And get return values. And finally, we need a way to do the method call itself. Um, so if we manage to implement all of these capabilities um, in, this new, in this new scheme, so instead of talking to a local object, this guy talks to a remote object, um, we can make it work. And if we do it clever enough, we can make it work so that this application looks pretty much the same. Um, so let's think about the interface one first, all right? To define an interface in, say, Java or any, any language, if you know your component's going to be written in the same language, you just use whatever the local technology is. For Java, it would be interfaces. For C++, uh, pure virtual classes or whatever. Um, and then you define what the methods are and what the argument types they pass are. Um, since we don't know what architecture this is over here, we don't know what language this is written in, we must define, and this interface is how this guy and this guy know about each other, we have to define things a little more generally. So there's a bunch of things called IDLs for naturally interface description language or interface definition language. And associated with each of these technologies, there's one of these things. There's like a Java IDL and a Corba IDL, and there's a Microsoft IDL, which is a variant of DCE IDL. Um, and these let you describe things, write expressions that look very much like Java interfaces. You know, they're in syntactically, they look almost identical, except that the data types that you use aren't going to be language-specific data types. They're just abstract, basic types defined by the IDLs. Fortunately, all languages pretty much implement the same set of basic data types, like you know, integers, bytes, floats. Okay, all those. There's not very controversial arrays. Everybody pretty much knows how to handle those. Strings are a little controversial, so. IDLs typically have an abstract string type, which is independent from you know, C++ string type or uh, Java string type. It's just an abstract string type that you use for communication and definition. And then it, of course, has to get bound locally to the, the proper equivalent on each side. Um, so that's a good way. We have a mechanism now that both sides can figure out what the interface is and can communicate there. Now we need a way to construct and hold references. Um, and the way this is usually done is by a mechanism called a proxy. Okay, this is a design pattern that one will run into. So we have a little piece of thing code here called a proxy, also called a stub, probably more commonly called a stub. And what this does is basically fake up this object over here. So this 
is, in Java, it would be a class definition. And it would have be a class definition with exactly the same interface that we defined here, OK, that you could do new on, call new on, and, and call a constructor on, and get a reference back. And you could hold reference objects on, OK? So it would look to this application just like a, if, if this object was implemented over here, it would look just the same. That's the image that this proxy stub is trying to create. So now this application can talk in the native language in Java using the regular new um, and regular method calls. It just talks to this proxy. So, I'm sorry, the yeah. proxy stub is something in the local process, or is it another process on this machine? Uh, Think of it as something in the this part. This part's in the local process. Okay. okay. The the, uh, the object wherever it exists just got reference counted. Uh, um, we haven't we haven't connected to this yet, but so okay. we're just we've just faked something up that looks like that object to here. We haven't quite connected it up. Uh, okay. okay. Now the next thing we have to do is somehow connect. We we we've now mirrored kind of this ob the object on the application part. We now have to make something over here that can call into the object that uh, looks like the application, all right? And this is sometimes called the uh, skeleton, I think, or it's probably another version of proxy uh, or the general proxy notion. The general proxy design pattern is to make something that stands in for something else and makes it look and looks like something else but isn't something else. So it's kind of a translator that kind of stands in between. Um, I mean, you can think of this a little bit, the scheme of trying to make a telephone call between someone, say, in, uh, in Germany who speaks German and English to talking to someone in Japan who speaks English and Japanese, okay? So you first have to set up a telephone call between them, and then you have to translate between them. And, you know, if you get somebody who, who uh, if you have somebody who only speaks German, then somebody who speaks German and English, he can talk to somebody who speaks English and Japanese, who can then translate into somebody who speaks purely Japanese, okay? That's one analogy for what's going on. Um, and if that translation scheme sounds absurd, there's been ARPA projects to do exactly that. So, um, All right, so now we have something that the application can call normal in-process methods on the stub, and it's happy. We have the, the uh, skeleton over here, which is calling into our, our remote object, so it's happy. It's it's doing a, a news and uh, method calls on this. So now all we have to do is hook this guy and this guy together, and we are golden. So this, each one of these guys has a different mechanism to do it. In uh, Corba, that is the job of our orb, which stands, I remember now, for Object Request Broker which lives in a different process on the same machine and will take requests from the proxy, um, which are now, get the proxy takes requests like constructors or method calls, translates them in this very, into this very general IDL language, and the orb will hook it up to um, to the other side of this. Now, you can have one, if both of these processes were on the same machine, this orb would be able to hook them directly, but since they're over the network, this is the network, um, it has to talk to each other with uh, our IIOP, which stands for Internet Interorb Protocol, just a way to go and talk to each other. Um, in Java, this whole mechanism that that does all this is RMI for remote method invocation. And uh, 
now you can do, you know, since there's all these competing standards, they're also sort of interoperable, so you can do, there's implementations that do RMI over IIOP and maybe IIOP over RMI, so you could talk from Java to Corba and, you know, everything kind of sort of works. Yeah. To uh, enterprise Java means working with this uh, Java to Corba thing at all? Enterprise Java beans are, are one way of defining these um, objects, these remote objects over here. So it supports, you know, it feeds in with this RMI and all of this. Enterprise Java beans go beyond that and are trying to encapsulate some additional functionality. Okay. Well, I think the main thing that you want to, that enterprise Java beans, and this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, want to add is transactions. So they want to add uh, this, this stuff, technology called component transaction monitors, which is kind of the big jump between Java beans and EJB. These guys, although e, this stands for enterprise Java beans, these guys and these guys have very little in common, except they're ultimately Java classes at some level. But, uh, you know, this is trying to give you support for distributed transactions. Um, and the Java beans are more for in-process. But, but, yes, the, the EJB technology is much more geared towards the, the distributed object than the Java beans technology. Uh, I realize we're getting ahead of ourselves, but when you say transactions, right. what are you talking about, um, like, something happening over here in the process at this stuff is, something happening over here where the skeleton is and the two making an agreement that they have actually, I, I don't understand. Well, we'll talk, transactions is really Monday's topic, but, you know, uh, for now, transactions are a sequence of operations that have across them certain properties that you that are true, okay? And we'll talk Monday about what the properties are, but they're just a sequence of operations that could handle, happen in your network or on a single machine and there's a set of four properties in particular that are critical for transactions. Um, but that's, that's a whole different topic. Um, so what do we need to do to make this network thing work? Um, it's actually not too tricky, though it's tedious. We have to be able to pass arguments, which means we have to do something called marshalling, which is taking all of the data structures in our language-dependent form translating them into a network language independent form, shipping them across the network, collecting them over here, and then retranslating them into the language dependent forms over here. Similarly, we have to take the re return value and do the reverse operation. Um, you, you mentioned reference counting and stuff. One of the things that we have to do is, um, Remember, this guy is doing a, a new on here, or an allocate an object on here, which is translating it across to here, which is saying, okay, make me a new one of these, and then passing back a unique ID so that this guy can associate that unique ID with the reference pointer it gives back here. So the whole thing works consistently across the network, okay? But now you have this network garbage collection problem, all right? Because uh, you have people all over the network holding pointers over here and or people all over the network holding pointers to objects over here and you have to know not only when your process has finished using them but when all the processes everywhere have finished using them and that gets to be a mess but again it's not uh, it's not on on uh, impossible it's just a matter of you know extending the stuff you would do in process with a lot of communication across the network, okay? Plus, you have to worry about additional things in your uh, remote procedure calls and the like that what happens if you do a procedure call over here, you do a method somewhere in the middle of here, the network goes down or this machine crashes or all sorts of things can go wrong, you need an additional set of recovery tools over here to deal with that. Or if this guy's going fine but then the caller deteriorates, how do you garbage collect all of his objects? A lot of details are hidden behind this, op, this, uh, this kind of nice picture, which is why this is really the cutting edge of, uh, 
of uh, enterprise technology. It's, it's non-trivial to get one of these things up and running and reliable and maintainable. And so the, you know, if the people who initially wrote the applications leave, uh, you can still keep it going. So this is really, really the cutting edge of kind of what's known as distributed enterprise uh, programming. Uh, it's fun though, and you know, you can take this model if you're just uh, not using sort of this technology, but just rolling your own. You can certainly roll your own scheme to do this sort of thing in a more limited sense. If you ever have an application where you have something over here you have to talk to and something over here. Um, a lot of times what's over here is some interface to <coughs> your database, your main database. So this kind of gives you an object wrapper around your, uh, your company's database. So um, just something you should see. And uh, uh, someday you may end up having to deal with it, but certainly you won't in this course. But, but uh, it's, no, no, I do not have an example. We don't have anything running uh, for you at the moment. But uh, no, this is really, this is what gives software designers nightmares at night uh, is uh, the thought of uh, getting, getting one of these things up and running and stable and all this. You know, if you think of the number of things that have to be up and working for your method call to happen, right? You have to have your process up, the proxy working, the orb working, uh, the network working, this guy's orb working, and that process up, okay? Yeah? Uh, if you can get your hands on a copy of JBuilder Enterprise, there's working examples of this. Ah. Getting them to run <laughs> Well, that is always the challenge. But, uh, yeah, J2EE, uh, the enterprise, we're using J2 Standard Edition, J2 Enterprise Edition, I think has all of the RMI and EJB stuff um, in it and more. Um, so, all right.